G said, I'm going to go a little out of the box from what probably you normally do because I've talked with, with a lot of the guys at the other three classes I've done. And a lot of you are some pretty killer techs. That's why you hang around with this bunch. So some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, this first thing is upside down from that board up there. This is uh, nice to know, not need to know stuff. But it will give you an angle on how the inside of a PCM works and what's going on in there. Some of the stuff I know you already know because you're working on the outside. So I'm going to go inside and I've broken down some of the software inside the PCM to show you how it functions and how it talks to, to the uh, hardware inside the box and then how it controls the engine. So we're only going to spend about an hour on that because I don't think there's really that much information you need to know about that. Then the, the second half, we'll take a break, and then the second half, we're going to talk about diagnostics. And we're not going to talk about how to do them. We're going to talk about what happens up here. Um, I work with a, a friend that's a brain scientist. She teaches kids with ADHD and ADD how to work better. And when she was describing all this stuff to me, I said, Sarah, you're like talking about just about every automotive technician I know. And uh, mostly what she was talking about was how we manage our time when we get involved in a, in a job. And uh, nothing wrong with it. As it turns out, ADHD kids are usually brilliant. Um, in fact, a lot of techs are, um, are ADD. That doesn't mean it's a good thing or a bad thing. It just means you've got to learn differently and you do things differently. And actually, that usually makes us really cutting edge because I've got pretty good symptoms of that stuff myself. So, so we're going to go through this first part and then we'll get into this other thing. And I'm going to talk about your brain, so stick with me because it'll start to make sense as I start to weave it back into how you do diagnostics. So let's start with this. Oh, and by the way, this is my email address. If this is too much trouble for you, just drop me an email or email G. He's got links to both of the presentations I'm doing. Um, this is a new version of the software I use and I didn't realize it was going to be like microscopic when it got to you. So. Um, just email it and I'll send you a link to it. You can download a PDF version of it and put it up on your machine and look at it or show your kids or your techs or whatever. Um, there's some pretty pictures in a second. So, okay, we're going to talk about what's in the box. For those of you that don't know me, um, I've been working on cars since I couldn't lift cylinder heads to put them on an engine because that's what we did in my family. I'm third generation. Um, so. I've been turning wrenches for a long time, and most of the stuff I learned, I learned by screwing it up. Um, my dad was adamantly against me going to a tech school because the tech schools weren't very good in our area. So I learned everything from him. And my dad's a really good technician. Uh, but we were I started right in the break between electronics being in cars and not. That's when I started. So I learned electronics almost entirely on my own. Um, went to a few AC Delco classes. I was a Ford guy, so I had to learn. The first thing I remember seeing, I'd only been turning wrenches for about five or six years at, for a living, and I went up to the Ford dealer, and there was this car with this wacky-ass engine in the engine compartment. And I'm like, what the hell is that? It was a five-liter Ford with fuel injection, you know, 87, 88 Ford. And uh, I had to check that stuff out. So we never worked on Euros where I'm at, because in my market, they just don't exist. So there's a few Volkswagen. So I knew how to set a CIS up. But, but nothing like, like what these things had. So I got really interested in it. And as a result of that, in trying to do diagnostic work in our shop, we do a ton of it. There are 53 shops within a mile and a half of me. Um, and they, a lot of them, they just slide the name out and put a new one in every six months. Because there's no control in our city at all over general licenses or tax licenses or anything. So it makes it very interesting. So that's where I kind of came from. I also serve on the National Automotive Service Task Force as a Tool and Equipment Committee co-chairman. Um, I guess I got fired from that job because I got elected to the board. I can't run a committee too, I guess. So that's what I heard. I don't know. Um, and I'm also on the ASA board of directors. Um, so you know, if ASA has pissed you off in the past, I apologize. We fired that guy. So <laughs> moving on. Let's talk about computers. Basically, I'm going to boil this down to the basics. Our PCMs are basically just a bunch of switches, power supplies, and controlled voltage drops, right? And we've got some wiring, also known as a printed circuit board. Some really good wiring normally because it lasts a long time. We've got logic modules, which you know you've seen. They're not all that different, frankly, from what's in personal computers. They're just up until recently have been quite a bit slower and not quite as sophisticated. And we've got memory, just like personal computers have. And of course, networking. 
which has gone from being that sort of eh, okay thing to pass information around to blazing. And I, I, I told the guys before, Monday night when I was teaching, a good friend of mine, who's a software programmer, was up in Boston doing a presentation on distributed computing. So basically what happens is you put a whole bunch of computers on a network and you set them about doing jobs. And when one of them is too busy, another one turns into that same computer and does the same thing. They basically morph into what they need to be. It's kind of like a virus, but it's a virus that talks to each other. So the network is passing this information around. I think that's what we're going to see with cars. Because there's just only so many boxes you can put on this thing before it just starts getting crazy. Um, anybody seen that ISIS power system for, for hot rods? It's, it's, um, it's got a power unit at the back, a power unit at the front. You know, a lot of luxury cars are like this. And it's got a unit under the dash, and you hook um, an Ethernet cable up to each one of them. And then the central unit can actually monitor and diagnose if there's a light problem going on at the back of the car. Well, I think that's, I think they're a step ahead of where the OEs are going to go because the other thing, the whole box weighs about eight pounds. And when you're trying to drop weight, you're going to have to use less parts. So I think we're going to see a lot of this go that way. So what that means is all this stuff that's in the PCM is going to wind up some, somewhere centrally located. Right now it's in the PCM and sometimes we got backup stuff over in the instrument cluster depending on the manufacturer. So why the computers to begin with? I'm not going clear back into the beginning. I'm going to actually talk about why they're there now. Obviously, this was the number one driving thing emissions. That was the biggest problem, right? We wanted to get the cars cleaned up, so we put computers on to control emissions. We also wanted to get better, more efficient operation to make them better to drive. I got a 1940 Lincoln Zephyr at my shop right now, and I bet you you take 10 drivers out there on the street and have them start that car, they couldn't do it because they don't know that there's a choke you can pull and a throttle you can set and that you've got to pump it a couple of times. That's, that's beyond them, right? Because cars haven't done that for years. So efficient operation. So anybody can go out and turn the keys. I built a bunch of cars for Sobe Beverages a few years ago, about PR cars, when we sent this little van. You might have seen it. Uh, it was all over New York City. We sent this little Dodge van out, Scooby-Doo van. It was carbureted. It had a 318 and a carburetor on it. We sent it out. And they brought all these kids in that were driving, so I could train them how to drive these old cars, which was just fun. And I get a call the first week there in New York City from this little girl who's driving. She says, Donnie, it won't start. I said, well, well, what's it doing? Hold the phone out. Let me get it. Because I thought maybe it was okay. Right? She turns the key. Let's go. See? I'm like, honey, you've got to crank it a little bit. It's, it's got to have a minute. You know, it's got to get the fuel going, and we got to get it down into the engine. It's not fuel injected. She cranks it, and I get this big squeal. Oh my God, it works! They're just not there. They don't understand that. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny to us because most of us have actually seen a carburetor in action. We know what it looks like, but they don't. And a better driving experience, as we just talked about. And last of all, to manage bad drivers. You know why we don't have any cables anymore? It's not just because it's noise, vibration, and harshness. It's also to smooth out those people that you ride with and they go like this the whole time they're, you're driving with them. Well, part of it is the computer's going, well, you know, I could get a lot better gas mileage if you weren't jerking all over on the TPS all the time. So now it kind of buffers that information. If you're cruising along and you're one of those people that does this, if you notice, try it in one of these new cars. It uh, smooths it right now, doesn't it? It also can kill you. If you mash the pedal in one of these things, it's like, well, did he mean that? <laughs> okay. Anybody know what this is? Computer resolution. Excellent. Okay. There we go. G showed me how to use it. So this is exactly that. This is computer language. Um, this is a 2003 or 4, doesn't matter because it's the same program, um, Mustang with a supercharger on it. Um, this is actually just all you can see of it because this is 47 pages of this, is the actual software that runs this car. And this has got everything from the gear ratios that the car runs on to What's the pulse output of the vehicle speed sensor? If it were an automatic transmission, it would have all the shift tables and all that stuff in it. And so if you read this stuff, it doesn't mean anything to you. 
if you know what all these addresses are, then you can start figuring it out. When we do custom programming, and I do a little bit of that, you got to go in and make a definition table to explain that stuff. But this is just what that software looks like if you just turn it into a text document. So when I built this class, I thought I was going to be able to do this all based upon a sort of generic approach to it. So I asked my buddies at Ford and General Motors and Chrysler, could you send me over your stuff when you're diagnostic executive and how you set up your software? Sure, they sent it over. That was great. They don't do anything the same. They get the same outcome, but how they get there is completely different. General Motors, when they started OBD2, they threw everything out and started over. They clean sheeted the entire operating system, which was probably what everybody should have done. Ford was pretty happy with their Act 4, so they modified it and made it Act 5. Uh, Chrysler has pieces of everybody who's owned them built into their package. So trying to explain that, I could see I wasn't going to win that battle. So I went ahead and went with Ford, but I'm going to show you the shift table actually out of a Camaro, um, uh, an, an LS1 Camaro, because this is pretty much how everybody does it. And I'll make this bigger for those of you in the studio audience who can't see what I'm doing. So. Everything inside of a PCM is basically a glorified spreadsheet. It's just hidden really well in that code so that you know knuckleheads don't go in and mess with it. So we've got mile per hour, that, that's one of our configuration angles. We've got load and we've got throttle position. And then throttle position relates to a shift point. So this is just a graph of what happens. You can see the one two shift when we don't have a lot of throttle position sensor input it all happens at pretty low speeds. The computer has a pretty good idea where to do all of this stuff all the time and doesn't have to make calculations. That's your ROM, right? Your read-only memory. However, as it goes along, it creates adaptives to adjust for things. Like, let's say we got a little bit of plate wear going on in a clutch pack in a trans. That might cause that thing to act a little different. So it's looking at an input shaft speed sensor, an output shaft speed sensor. It'll adjust the pressure to make these things happen the way they need to happen. And all of this is all based upon spreadsheets, a set of rules that are in there. So when you see this kind of a situation, this is what we're going to be looking at all through all these tables tonight. And they all go up to, to numbers that all divide out by 32, 16, 8, because that's how computers work, right? So that's why our minimum is 0 and our maximum is 256 miles an hour, because it's a divisor of 8. So everything's a divisor of 8 in these things. Okay. So the next thing I'm showing you here is um, this is a mass <laughs> air transfer table. You will not be able to read it, but I'm going to tell you what's kind of going on here. So everybody know what's a, what's a mass airflow sensor's peak voltage? This type of sensor. So it's 5 volt sensor, 0 to 5 volts. It runs on a vehicle reference signal, right? So, how do you suppose they figure out what that sensor's doing? They have to have a, a comparison sheet, right? If I see this voltage, that means something. So what we did with this one was I needed a mass airflow sensor that had quite a bit of resolution for turbocharged, supercharged cars, and that sort of thing. So this happens to be that same Cobra that's got a really good mass airflow sensor on it because up at peak voltage, it'll do almost 1,700 CFM. So what we did was we took this, and of course when you see it on your scan tool, it's usually in grams per second, right? That, that kind of thing, depending on how you're set up, but generally like that. Well, I needed to know CFM so that I could do calculations on my dyno software and then work out about where that curve needed to start so I could start an engine that was all from scratch. So we hooked this up to a dyno and ran an engine on the back end of it and watched the, uh, watched the airflow on a superflow and came up with this chart that matched these voltages. So I can take this whole chart, drop it into a Camaro or a Corvette or a Mustang or whatever, and this will run just, just fine. And it doesn't know whose mass airflow sensor is as long as the information's right. And then this is the transfer graph, so it just sort of gives you an idea of what it looks like. So you see where it's got a lot of resolution down here? Anybody got an idea why? This is where we spend most of our time driving. So we need really good resolution to get good emissions down here, right? 
So then once we start getting up here, we're really leaning on it. We're not in closed loop anyway. It's looking at this and saying, okay, I'm about here. Dial the fuel up. Of course, we're never going to hit this number. Keep in mind, we're going to talk about it later, but um, Ford's strategy internally is 4.79 volts is clip. That's the maximum voltage. Clip means that's the highest number that it will understand and read for a mass airflow sensor. So if it actually sees 5 volts, it won't do anything with it. Now, there are some situations where if it sees 5 volts, it's a code. Okay, so how do other inputs work? So from what you've seen here, how do you reckon a temperature sensor looks? Say so it exactly. It's just a spreadsheet that says, if I'm at this voltage, this is the temperature. This is where it gets really critical that these parts have to actually function the way they come out of the box because they're expecting to match that information. So how about oxygen sensors? Anything different about them? No, not really. They've got a few additional tables they use um, to handle bias and things like that. Crank and cam sensors are a little bit different. We'll, we'll look at one of those in a minute. And then your pressure sensors, your barometric pressure, your MAP sensor, your fuel tank pressure, all of those are just spreadsheets. <coughs> and usually, by the way, a two by eight. They got two columns and they got eight entries, and that's all they really need. Some are more sophisticated than that and need a lot more range, but most of them have about eight entries. So, here's, here's your old standard garden variety crank cam signal, right? So, what do you reckon the PCM's looking for here? Yeah, it's looking for a pulse. It's looking for a heartbeat. Fine. So, this is this is your kid over there with the light switch going. Right? Yeah, it's looking for it to switch, and it's and then it's looking for the rhythm that it does it in, because it calculates and ties everything and syncs everything back to that piece of information. So, this thing, if it had a signature. You know, if you had the long tooth or the short tooth or whatever, you'd see that in there, and the computer recognizes that signal as that's where I start. So that's why, you know, the old Jeeps cranked longer because they had to synchronize both of those items together before they could say, I got sync, and then run the engine. So they had that longer, longer crank than other cars did. What did you mean by long tooth? Oh, have you ever seen a, a, a cam sensor get the, with the teeth on it? like on the front of an engine, okay. there's one. There's usually one tooth that's longer than the others if it's in a sequential situation. And that's that's like the dead tooth. That's the one that says this is where you start the sequence. So there will like be 35 teeth and one will be big. And uh, so that's where they say, okay, that's number one. For it's a reference. Spark. Yeah, it's a reference. Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. And next time you have the front off of an engine, um, you know, when you're looking at a timing chain set up on one that's got a cam sensor up in the front, you look for that, you'll see a little signature, and the, and the computer sees that as a signal that just says, okay, this is where we do, do our sync. And then, of course, we assume that the crankshaft will still be synchronized to it because it's connected to it in some way. That may not be that way for all that much longer, but for right now, they're synced together. Okay. So let's, let's look at what a PCM is thinking about when it sees inputs. So as, as I said before, all of these inputs that you're seeing, they go to a table somewhere. And the PCM is comparing what it sees coming in to that piece of information. But it goes a lot deeper than that. It's not just, OK, I go here when this is happening, and I do this. That's just the beginning. That's actually what probably like Ec1 did. OK, appropriate responses are then determined and the output sections receive their commands. I'm not spending any time on output sections because you guys are probably more competent at diagnosing those than anything else because those are the parts that do the work and they're usually the parts that fail. Although that's gotten even to where those don't fail very often anymore. So how does it determine load? I got, Rusty gave me a hard time about this, but gee, warned me he would. So, um, but I was looking at PCMs and Rusty was thinking of other things. So PCM. It has to create load. What thing does it look at? How does it figure out what the load is? TPS, mass airflow. TPS, mass air. Anything else? Vacuum. Most of the input sensors. Use barometric pressure, right? What else? There's there's one really important one. RPMs. RPM. 
it has to know where it's loaded, where it's going, because every table's got RPM tied into it. And uh, so, yeah, you got a barometric pressure by whatever means, whether it's a map sensor or, a, or just a BP or whatever it is. Throughout position, as you said, the mass airflow input, which is mostly the critical one for load. You can just about disconnect everybody else as long as that one's working. How about EGR? Do you know why EGR? It's air that's, that's measured when it comes in through the math, right? Technically, it's input air. It goes through, but it goes through the engine and then we bring it back. And that's not met metered air, right? So we have, when we bring it back in again, we gotta calculate that in or we get into a problem. So that's when a lot of times you have an EGR problem, you'll actually feel the engine performing badly because the PCM is expecting there to be some additional air coming in. Even though it's you know inert and it's not doing anything, it still fills up space. So EGR command is important and part of calculating load. Have you ever seen a vehicle, you're driving down the road, you're looking at the scan tool and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. That load number doesn't make any sense. I got my foot on it pretty good and, and it's saying 30%. Well, keep in mind that all of these items, if you clipped all of them, if you took them up to their maximum with the PCM could read, you probably could get 100% load out. Um, I've actually seen a supercharged car that wasn't calibrated to be supercharged go over 100% load right before it shut down um, because it was a Chrysler and it was like, I don't know what's going on, power takeover and it shut down, right? But you really can't ever get all of these at 100%. So you're really, as far as the PCM is concerned, you're not really at 100% load. So just keep in mind that, that that number you're reading on the scan tools is an aggregate, it's kind of just a lie. But it gives you a general idea where you're at and what the computer thinks you're at. So we're going to spend some time on load because I thought it was interesting to see how load is affected or how the software and the computer handles the information it generates from load. So over here on the left side of the chart is the actual load. This is assuming the sensors have already put that number together for the PCM. Okay, and then as we go across, it's going to go across this way, and this is sort of how the process. So one of the things I want to show you, though, first, just as something to think about, although I guess I'd go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so up here, there you go. Okay. Right over here, just barely peeking off the screen, is our neutral safety switch, or neutral drive switch, or Park, whatever you call switch, it. whatever whatever you like. Okay, everybody's got a name for it. This thing has its own function. That right here is part of a diagnostic operation. Uh, this function 35. It's the peak load versus RPM. Well, if this switch is doing nothing, if it's a manual transmission and the clutch is pushed in and that circuit is closed, then it assumes it's in neutral. On an automatic application, it's the opposite way around. You know, if it's in drive, it's connected. If it's in park, it's an open circuit, or at least most of the time that's the way it is, or vice versa, depending on how it's wired. But what I'm getting at is if this signal is not what the PCM is expecting to see, if you're sending it a neutral signal or a park signal while you're driving, you're circumventing a whole bunch of charts, and you're going to have some really crazy things that won't set codes. So this is not something you're going to see every day, but just think about with inside the PCM, things like this will happen if it's got an input that isn't working. And sometimes crazy things will happen, so you can't rule out simple things like brake inputs and vehicle speed sensor inputs and all the stuff that comes in just because it's not setting a code yet, which yeah, VSS is going to set it. But if this isn't setting a code yet and it's not impending because it hasn't figured it out yet, it can do some crazy stuff. And since this isn't a code that's going to set a trip in a Ford, this one can be a real fun one to find, particularly in diesels. That's not experience at all talking to you, by the way. So what we're going to look at right now is we're going to look at the way Ford handles timing. Um, a lot of the OEs do this really similarly, but Ford has a unique way of processing timing information. And I thought it would be interesting because it gives you sort of an idea of why you might have a problem that you ever had a, car, a Ford in particular you're driving along and you get it to ping and then you put it under a slightly different condition and it won't do it but you're in the same throttle you're under the same kind of load and it won't do it 
it's because you're moving around in these tables and certain tables will cause it. So a lot of times there's a software update to fix that or they do something like pulling out the little plug or whatever to make this thing bypass several degrees. But let's look at how that works so that it'll make more sense why that kind of thing can happen. Because um, sometimes there's no way on earth you can fix it. So, all right, let's blow this up a little bit too. Yeah, we'll blow this up a little bit. So we're going to start by looking at, oh, by the way, we're going to start by looking at this function. It's 071. You don't need to know that other than I'm going to reference it several times, so I'm just giving you numbers so we have something to reference. That's a, that's a function line in the, in the software code. And then we're going to go over here and we're going to look at these guys. 901, 904, 905. We're going to look at those because those have to do with timing at altitude or sea level or under load. Okay, this is a piece of software I use when I tune a I ride forward. You notice right here, you'll see that there's that function. This is what it means to the PCM. This is what's in the table. The table is load from basically 5% up to 75%. The reason they don't show over 75% is at that point it's basically <laughs> running straight off of ROM and your, your open loop other than some fine tuning of math inputs and, and O2 outputs. You're not really in full on fuel control when you're mashing the pedal of the car to the floor, particularly on a supercharged car. You just get the fuel there. So the other thing that while we're on this table, we want to look at, as soon as I move it back over, there we go. up here is our, our function 70, that's our RPM. So across here, you see it goes 500 to 4,000. What happens in between all these spots is instead of having to do them in really little tiny increments, because that takes a bunch of data and a bunch of memory, they use bigger chunks. And then they just draw a curve, a line, in between all of those points. And so the timing, which may be only a base of 8 degrees, right here at 500 RPM, up to 4,000 along that wide open throttle load, kind of moves up to 2,100. So they just draw a line through there. But that, they may draw a line through here, because this may be the way that the driver drives it. Or it may be like this, depending upon how the load is. So it's working across that table as it goes, it's not a straight line. That, that way you've got all of these different cells at these different loads that have all been calculated to get the best torque. That's what this table really is all about, is getting the best torque out of the engine. So let's move on. This is a, this is a bigger version of it. Again, we've got our load over here. Normalized load means this is what the computer's aggregated, it's average. This is what the load is for the engine. And then, of course, RPM at the top. And then those are just some numbers I plugged in. So back to this again. OK, so these tables right here. Let's look at, uh, let's look at this one right here first. This is the, called the base spark table. When you look at this, you'll say, gosh, those don't really look like the timing numbers that these engines run. And that's true. It's, this is the, basically, this is the minimum level that they might run unless there's detonation. Almost all tables are adders in here. They multiply up. They add time. So when I'm at a certain load, I'm going to multiply the timing times 1.025, or I'm going to multiply it times whatever as it goes up. This setup here is the mash the pedal to the floor timing setup. When the engine's really under load, this is where it goes. This is our, our the, the one that it always falls back to. It's, they call it their aggressive table. Okay, so then we go out. This one is our sea level table, which is one that where probably most of the vehicles you're dealing with are driving. Most of the vehicles I deal with are on that 905A high altitude table because most of my cars are 5,000 feet or more, unless we've got a really big hole in the ground. So you'll see there, those charts also have changed a little bit. You know, their, their timing is different. Their numbers are a little higher. Do you suppose that a vehicle running along at 20% load at 2,000 RPMs running 36 degrees of timing most of the time? Probably not. It's probably going up. It's probably going down, depending on the situation. But this is where it starts from. 
So this table only gets modified really by ping if it's got a if it's got a knock sensor on it. The knock sensor's got a chart in it where it can go in and just override. Say, okay, we've got a ping problem depending on how hard it is and what the frequency of it is. That's how much timing I'm going to draw out until I stop the problem. Now this computer also has the ability to build an adjustment table and say, this thing's been pinging a lot, so from now on when I get here, until I see a major refueling event, I'm going to keep taking this timing out. So you get somebody who's, who's rattling an engine pretty good, they're going to get this table all fouled up. This is, the, uh, this is that sea level table that we just looked at. Now keep in mind, like I said, they're all modified by others. So a lot of times the end result is passing through several other modifications on the way. So, but the main one that modifies this is the, the sea level multiplier, this number, versus the calculated barometric pressure. And that's a whole other table. So again, just so it was a little bit bigger. The desired timing would still be modified by detonation in both of these situations. And then there's another table that adds in when you've got EGR, how much extra timing do I add for EGR? So all of this stuff's going on all at one time, and at the end of the day, it comes up with that magic number that if you were putting a timing light on it, you would see. And of course, this happens in less than milliseconds. So this is an air-fuel ratio table. This is an open-loop air-fuel ratio table. Anybody reckon they, they're going to see a 55, 90% load engine running at 8, 9 to 1 air-fuel ratios? These are in there because at some point somebody's going to take this car to Montana or Alaska and try to start this. And they need a lot of extra fuel. And rather than building a, t a table with the charts for the, the, the uh, sensor, because it can only go so low, right? And not have really that great a resolution when it gets low. So if they're going to go up there and start it at 60 below, we're just going to put a bunch of fuel in. And if it needs to run that much fuel, fine. If it doesn't, we'll take it back out another way. So that's where you get these kinds of numbers. And you can see that they're, even when they're cold, once they start getting up into you know, a range you'd actually operate the car in, they're actually already starting to shoot for, for stoic up in there until you get up into load, because this is obviously very lightly loaded all through here. And you've got 14s and all that. This table, just like that timing table, there's multiple modifications for it to get it out of there. So those numbers are just starting points. A lot of tuners go in and start messing with these and can't figure out why nothing's happening with the tail. So this little bit, anybody ever have a customer bring in a car with different fuel injectors in it? And it doesn't run right? No? You've never seen that? Gosh, I need that all the time. I guess I'm just a victim of those guys. Anyway, I'm going to show you why fuel injectors, you can't just swap them. You're probably not going to run across that many situations where you're going to get an injector that's delivered to you that's not the right injector, but you really need to watch them because color isn't good enough anymore. A lot of the offshore injectors that come in, they're not the right spec. And I'll show you what, what we're looking for. It's hard to find the <coughs> specs for a lot of these injectors, um, but that's why I'm real careful about where, I, where they come from. So we've been looking at tables. We've been looking at spreadsheets all along. There are other portions of the software that describe the components themselves. And that tells the computer, this is the factor to multiply on when I send a signal, particularly in output sections like injectors. So I'm going to show you some of these. And they've all got cool little names like FNPW at offset. This is the function pulse width at offset. And they've got all this, these funny names. And they really don't matter, because unless you're going to start tuning stuff, you'll never see them. But I'm going to show you what they do. OK, this one over here, this is what we call the low slope. This is called the high slope. You'll see there's a several digit out number. This is how much fuel per second that injector flows. Here's what's, uh, here's what's sort of interesting to know. And it's hard to explain, but I think I got it down now. A fuel injector is not as efficient at delivering fuel when it's barely open. And I'm not talking about volume, I'm talking about efficiency. Obviously, it doesn't deliver as much volume when it's down, but it also doesn't do it very effectively. As that pulse width starts to increase, it becomes more effective. And every injector, based upon its size and the way it's wound and the way it's put together and how much inductive force it's got, is a little different. And we call that its breakpoint. 
the point at which it goes from being not so efficient to more efficient. If you swap an injector in where these two numbers are different, it may be a 24 pound injector going in for a 24 pound injector, but if you swap these in, you're going to feel the difference. You will actually feel the break point, particularly as you're coming off idle. And when you're driving a light throttle, they'll trailer hitch, just like you had them jetted too lean. Um, and then there's this other one that's kind of hypercritical. Many injectors have a minimum pulse width at which they can even be pulled out the seat to deliver fuel. This particular injector has is a minimum of 1.053 milliseconds. So if you put an injector, a program in this that would have this injector going below one millisecond, it just flat won't open. So what do you suppose happens when that? You're driving along, and if the computer's dithering that thing at all, you got this. <laughs> And uh, so if you ever get a modified car in, maybe you just tell them to go on. I work on a lot of modified cars, so I see crazy stuff. But at any rate, this, this is the kind of problem you can run into if the injectors have been changed or if they were bad replacements that don't meet the spec. So let's look at that, what the math of that is. So the low slope in this, in, in this situation, we take that, that lower number, we multiply it times 3,600, that gets us to pounds per hour, which most of us are more familiar with or cc's, I, I did it on pounds. Um, so you see, we're telling the computer that this injector is a 26.2 pound per hour injector to help it to deliver better. But then when it's, when it's at its high slope, when it's doing uh, you know, more flow, we tell it a number that's more accurate. That's what this thing actually flows, is 24.9. That's a 24 pound injector, that's, that's what they call that. It's rated at that. And then of course our break point is our transition between the two of these and there's our minimum pulse width. Now there's another thing, have you ever had a car that comes in, the alternator's dead, the battery's nearly dead, and it's still running, and you can't believe it's still running? Well, you would think that that would be a big issue for the fuel injectors and or the drivers in the circuit, but as it turns out, this is a function that's built in. This is to allow us to compensate for when the alternator's charging 14 volts as opposed to when it's charging only 12, it's got a big load on it, and it's in the high 12s instead of clear up, you know, where it would be when it's coasting along. Well, as it turns out, that changes the delivery on the fuel injectors, and we don't want to have to have the oxygen sensor be the only way to correct for that, because that thing would be working its tail off all the time, right? Because we'd have all these things changing as voltage change. So, they figure out where that injector is efficient and where it's not, and interestingly enough, between 10 and a half and 11 volts, that injector's efficiency is about one to one. That, that starts to increase and it gets more effective as it goes on. <clears throat> so if you put one millisecond in, you get one millisecond out right up here. But if you put one millisecond in up here, you're going to have to shorten that, that actual time by almost half a millisecond. So you're just going to get into where you have to change this uh, to get this thing all to work. Six volts, look at how much time you gotta add to that thing just to get it to actually fire. So this is built into everybody's PCMs. Everybody's got this capability. And all it's for is to help the PCM so it doesn't spend all of its time using fuel corrections from the oxygen sensor. So the oxygen sensor can really fine tune things instead of being a gross control. I'm sure I'm not really sure I understand uh, the comparison. You know, how you have a bomb the chart six volts compared to the, uh, the 3.2 and then you have the, the 15 volts and then the, I don't really understand the comparison between the two. Okay. So when when this thing, when, when the charging system's really fallen off and it's not <laughs> charging right, the object is to try to keep the car running so it can get off the road, right? So when it gets down in these lower voltages, charging system voltage on this side, this is a, an offset in milliseconds for the injector. So the injectors are turned on for, let's say, three or four milliseconds at, a, at an idle, maybe as high as 10 or 11, depending on the injector when they're, when they're under load. So to correct for the difference in voltage, because the injector gets more efficient, because it's electrical as you crank more voltage into it, you have to take some of that timing out so, so you don't open it quite as long, effectively. So if you take, if you take this and you, and you run an offset against this, you're going to basically be opening that thing 0.538 instead of one millisecond. And instead of putting that in a table, they put this alongside the regular injector table, 
and just say, okay, when the voltage is this, take whatever's coming out of the fuel table and reduce it by this much or increase it by that much. Did that explain it? Yeah, that one. Okay, thank you. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here and we're going to talk about the diagnostic executive. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, so inside the PCM, in OBD2 cars, you've got this diagnostic executive. You probably know them as monitors. So the diagnostic executive is the misfire monitor, the EGR monitor, the co comprehensive component monitor, catalytic converter, fuel system. If secondary air is still in that vehicle, it's, it's that. And then we've got the purge. And then I added one more because the diagnostic executive interacts with the mill. In fact, that's really how it tells you what's going on. So we're going to look at some of this and how this thing interacts with the software on the car to help you to fix problems. And because I thought it would be more fun, I made the diagnostic executive into a woman. So <clears throat> unless you want to talk about software, we can do it that way. So her job is to manage diagnostic trouble codes, first and foremost. This is a totally an emission control function. It tells you, I got a problem, or it tells the driver I have a problem, they ignore it, and then they bring it to you when it's actually broken, right? Manages diagnostic operations. So when you hook a scan tool up, and you go down the list and you say, yeah, I want to look at that, you're telling the diagnostic executive to go into a test that's built into the routines in the software of the PCM. Okay, so that's also her job. And then whenever there's a problem, she files reports like a good secretary and sticks them out there and keep a live memory for you. And says, okay, I have a problem with this, file it. Got a problem with that. The other really cool thing that she does is she goes back and checks her reports every once in a while and makes sure that they're actually accurate or if they need to be updated. She gets all of her rules from the ROM. The, the company employee handbook is all built into read-only memory in a computer. So whatever she's supposed to do, those are her rules right there. <coughs> she follows them. I'm going to show you some of those rules as we go along. So let's look at a sample of a diagnostic routine being run. So if you were starting with a P1000, I haven't run any monitors yet. She's going to go out and interface with each of those monitors and say, how's things going over there? You know, kind of cruise around the office, check out how everybody's doing. It starts with obviously the, the ones that are going to cause potential damage to the catalytic converter first and foremost. That's the first thing on her mind is making sure that her buddy the catalytic converter is in. Okay? So she's going to interface with that. If she determines that there's a problem, she's then going to decide, okay, does this need to stay impending? Does this need to be a non-mill or should I turn the mill on right away? And that's based upon those rules that, that she gets out of ROM, which we'll look at in a minute. Then she files that report we talked about. Then continues to watch that monitor. Here's what's really important. As these things get cranked up and you get more than one problem going on, the diagnostic executive is built in hard memory. So it can only do so much. And eventually it just says, I'm done. Turn the light on. we got to get some help. So let's look at a, a P0103. Anybody ever seen this code? It's, it's not terribly common, but it happens once in a while. It's just a really good example of this. This is a um, mass airflow sensor that's pegged all, all five volts, or in Ford's case, more than 4.79. And um, it's freaked out, and it's not paying attention to the math anymore. So built into the software, there's a routine called a fault filter that's called fault filter P103. P1, <coughs> P0103. And how it works is, it's looking at the mass airflow sensor as a 0 to 1,000 number. 1,000 is absolutely pegged, and 0 is all the way down. So that, that tells this thing, am I good or am I not good? Now, that's why you can have, you can have this kind of code going on. It doesn't really care about what's happening on the bottom, because its rules are, all I care about what's happening on the top. There's another code that's going to take care of what's happening if it goes open, right? It's not going to set the same code. So there's different routines. So we got a pretty busy beaver in there checking all this stuff out. The stored parameters in the filter determine the limit for the test. So that's that clip number that we're looking at. That's stored in there. That's what she's looking for. And then it also knows 
how long the test has to run, what the conditions have to be, how many times it has to trip it before it can actually store it in memory and, and make, it, make a code out of it. If the component's going to restrict running other monitors, it'll stop until the fault's corrected. You've all experienced that where you fixed a problem and then another code popped up right afterwards because it was in misfire or, or it was in fuel control or one of those. And you know, that's just something we know and we tell our customers, this one's right out in front. You could have anything going on behind it. I had to run all the monitors first to see. So if this has got a mass airflow sensor that's pegged, what is it not going to be able to do after this? Just think about some of the monitors that are not going to be able to run. Can I check cat? No. no. I got no idea how I'm going to check the cat because I don't know how much air is going to the engine. Um, can I run a secondary air injection deal? No, and I'm not going to anyway, because that becomes very minor by comparison, and I'm sure not going to add air if I think I'm adding too much fuel, because that might shoot flames out the tailpipe. So the whole thing involved here, here's the rule. Carb regs require the mill to eliminate no later than the end of the next drive cycle. So that's what she does. Okay, the end of the next drive cycle, I may come on. This, however, leaves flexibility for the OE to decide to bring this light on <coughs> earlier. They just can't do it any later than the next drive cycle. Now, in my experience, when Fords have this problem, it, it can come on while you're driving. It's not going to wait till you finish the cycle and start the car up the next morning to turn the light on. Um, also built into this code is if it gets three sequential clean starts, and, <coughs> I'm sorry, cycles, <coughs> excuse me, it'll turn the light back out. Of course, that doesn't usually happen when you've got a short power on these things. Okay, here's a little fun factoid, and then I'm going to give you a short break. And the next part isn't quite as dry. You can determine if the monitors have all been run on a Ford by leaving the key on the engine off for 15 to 20 seconds. I didn't know this, so that's why I thought it was kind of fun to share it with you. If all the monitors have not been run, the mill will blink for 5 to 10 seconds. If it doesn't blink, the monitors have all run. I found that very deep in their diagnostic executive thing that was like 65 pages deep. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. So um, I never had the patience to check before, but I guess if you want, if you, you guys have a mission program where you've got to, yep. you've got to check and see. So this way you can just turn the key on to see if, you know, say hey, all the monitors are running. You're good. Just on Ford, though. So. Well, one of the guys the other night told me that he thinks Jeep does the same thing, which would probably mean Chrysler does the same thing with all those JTEC modules. Um, but you can sure try it with others. This is just the only yeah. one I know for sure. So you have you verified that? Yes, actually I did when I because I, I found it before I left town, and uh, I actually verified it. Um, I cleared everything on my 2013 Focus and did it, and it did it. It had a P1000 in it. I checked first, and then I just left the key on, and sure enough, it flashed light for a little while, and then it went solid. So you do have to hang around long enough to see it happen. Or longer. Yeah. But you don't have to watch it for very long. Is that for a certain particular years? Uh, 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 from what I read, all OBD2 with them. All this was something they put in their original diagnostic executive. So, I'm not aware. Although you might not get it. You remember those wacky Mercury's and, and Panther body Fords that had the green check engine light? Those do not work like anything else they make, so all bets are off of them. But everything else that you'd probably be okay with. We were deprived all these years from not knowing this. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> well, I, I just thought it was kind of cool, and I figured if you had an emission program... It's in the owner's game. manual. <laughs> and, and on Chrysler, if you turn the key three times, you get the P codes in there, yeah. and the mill light works like that. So, throughout this whole thing, I'm going to throw a few diagnostic realities out at you. And some of them make you laugh, and some of them you're going to say, eh, I get it. I find the technicians, all of us, are almost incapable of reviewing a set of customers' concerns and not coming to some kind of diagnostic opinion. That's our experience working for us. Sometimes it's our experience working against us. Um, anybody that can go out and just say, I'm not going to think about what I think I know. I can't. i am always got that in the back of my mind. This is what my experience tells me. That is not a bad thing. What we're going to talk about is balancing that experience against using some other things at your, uh, that, that will make it easier for you to get past that. So why is it good to have 
good thought processes. Because a diagnostic process is a thought process, right? It's something you've learned and you've walked through. As it turns out, what I've learned from Sarah is it's very easy to create a bad one. And it's even harder to fix it sometimes without making a conscious effort to say, this doesn't work, I can't do it that way anymore. So this right here is a picture of a brain solving a problem. That's all the little neural connections inside the brain solving a problem. This person is thinking right now about fixing something or solving a problem. And you can see where all the activity is by the darker colors. And uh, you can see blood flow and all that stuff in there. So the reason we're going to talk about that is because we're going to talk about these little guys. They're called neurons. Neurons are part of your brain. And actually, that's what it's mostly made up of. We have about a billion of them. I mean, give or take how much beer you drink. Okay. So, or whatever else you might have done to yourself over the years. How much safety clean you've inhaled over the years. Okay, so each of those neurons creates about a thousand connections to other neurons, and that amounts to more than a trillion connections in your brain. That's from Scientific American. So because of that, and all those connections that occur, our brain has the capacity of 2.5 petabytes, which is a really, really big hard drive. Uh, one billion, or, I'm sorry, one million gigabytes, or to make it easier for you, about 31,250 iPads. Imagine if you were hauling that around behind your butt. Well, you're hauling it around on your shoulders. That's why your shoulders are tired all the time. Particularly a lot of you that have years and years of experience stored up in there. So just to put it another way, here's my antique television, and there's my TiVo. I would have to TiVo for the next 300 years all of the major network stations to fill a baby's brain. And yep, he was surprised by that too. <laughs> okay, so this is why we're going to talk about neurological pathways. So the importance for diagnosticians of creating good neural pathways is we create a routine, and what I'm asking you to do is to consciously create menus in your head. Just the way you look at your scan tool and you run down through those menus to make those tests, you need to build those same kind of thought patterns in your head. It sounds stupid, it sounds childish, but I guarantee you it works. That's how we teach ADHD kids to be organized. They run through menus. Okay, so bad programming leads to bad results. Anybody disagree? If you learn to do something wrong, you are gonna not get a good output, right? Have you ever done something wrong more than once? I have a class I do on reprogramming that I've been doing for years. And along the way in the class, it's got a, uh, it's got a slide where I talk about using a battery to support your PCM or, you know, while you're charging and, or while you're programming. I, and damn if it doesn't have a Medtronics box in it, and I can never remember the name Medtronics, but only when I do that class. Otherwise, I can pull it up for you anytime, anywhere, and I get to that spot in the class, and I'm like, and it's a... Uh, so I actually just put the box and a picture of it up there so I can remember what it is. But I actually programmed a bad pathway. The first time I forgot it, it stressed me out because I couldn't remember it. And it was probably the first time I taught the class, and then it just kept doing it. So the way I corrected it was I just changed the input so that I would make it different, all right? So diagnostic thinking requires controlling and blending that experiential stuff, the stuff you all know from all the cars you fixed, along with the creativity, the bringing out the scopes and the tools and all the other things that you have to do. We try to use both of those things to our advantage, right? Because that one side, that experience, well, that's free for you. You already own that. You don't, and you get to sell it again. And that's one of the important things that I think we all forget. That experience that you've got is worth something. It's not a .5 on a repair order, because what did it cost you to learn it the first time? And so often, we just say, oh, yeah, I know that. Well, that's great. You're the big guy, and you're going to give it away. So the big guy is giving away what he does. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. So that's why I put this whole class together, because it doesn't make sense to me. So let me show you an example of neuroplasticity. This is a term called building a neural pathway and then making adjustments to it as we go along. A lot of the things that we, we were talking, gentleman in the back, we were talking about, he said, I still do points. Wait, I do too, as a matter of fact, because we work on a lot of old cars. Uh, most of the time I try to talk them into solid state ignition. But, you know, <laughs> nevertheless, so that's a whole neural pathway that I have from when I was about 12 years old, and I could actually reach up over the fender and <coughs> make an adjustment to a set of points. So that didn't need to change much. But then all of a sudden electronic ignition came out, and could I apply that same knowledge to working on those? 
you know, had to learn a new one, right? I still kept this one because once in a while I need it. So here's an example, and, and there's flaws in this, so I want you to recognize that. And I'm sorry that it's really small, but it won't fit if I make it big. So I'm read it to you. Every day a Ford F-150 with a 5.4 liter comes into my bay and it has a misfire. Everybody knows what's wrong, right? Close. See? Close it. <laughs> well, they're not far from the truth, are they? <laughs> no, they're not. I hook up my IDS and I go to a power balance test. This is my path. You may have a different path. This is how I do it because I've got an IDS. I hook it up, I go to power balance because I can have a diagnosis on that like that and I know I'm right. The problem is always a bad coil on number seven. Or antifreeze in a hole. That is a damaged neural pathway, right? Because this is not always going to be true. It may be, but it's not always true. And I know from experience that, yeah, that may be a common one, you know, <laughs> coolant drips on it and takes it out, but that's not always the problem, right? Okay, so I made it up to this point, and I was probably doing okay. Now I'm out here, and maybe I'm not okay, so what do I do if it's not number seven? Oh, no. I go back to my IDS and I look and see which cylinder was actually dropping, right? So, but what if the coil isn't the problem and seven's still dropping? I gotta have another approach, right? So, what I'm suggesting to you is build the menu in your mind of where you're gonna go. If this happens, I'm gonna go to this. And you don't have to actually put your hands on it to do it, it helps. Because when we use our hands to create those, they become much more common. The more you travel, a pathway in your head, the better it will get. And it will become more automated for you the more you travel it. But you don't necessarily have to physically work on a car. You can just walk, talk yourself through it. Same way we do with sports and all that kind of stuff. You just go through it. So, I'm going to remove a spark plug. Maybe I'm going to do a cylinder leakage test. Maybe I find 80% leakage at an intake valve. The problem is a bad valve. Is this a good pathway to create? Because have I created for myself an expectation? Maybe I wouldn't go any further than I'm going to start here. I'm going to inspect this plug, make sure it's not broken, make sure the coil isn't zapping right through the side of the thing. Um, perform the cylinder leakage test, maybe. But what I want to get at is, up here is all experiential, right? You're, you're doing this all from what you know. You're, you're, this test takes you less than five minutes. This test is going to take you some time. Do a so, low compression test with your IDS and maybe we're going to have to take out the plug. Yeah, but go with me because I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to show you how to diagnose. I'm trying to show you how you don't want to think. So when you've got techs that are doing this kind of stuff where they get off path, but I, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, what I'm getting at is the way you program this in your head is what's important. And a lot of times if you're, if you're using your experience and going, oh, I just need to go to that. How often does that wind up being a waste of your time? Because, well, I've just done it that way every single time. And that's not necessarily a problem. So what I'm looking for is build a low risk menu. Start with the things that you can do quickly, efficiently, like what you're just talking about, running a relative compression test with your IDS, because that's going to give you that information you never had to get out of the driver's seat, right? So this is something I borrowed from Sarah. Over here is where most of us live. We have behavior. We learn to do things either conditioned or unconditioned. A lot of these unconditioned responses that we do when we work on cars are the bad ones. They're the things we learn because we got our butt kicked on something. And sometimes they're good because now we know never ever am I going to just assume that. But sometimes there are steps we take that we don't need to take. We're taking them because one time out of 500 times, this one thing will happen. And so how much time do you spend on that? If it's a few extra seconds to make sure a wheel's tight, that's got value. If it's going through, I had a tech who would re-diagnose his own diagnosis. He would go back through and check himself all over again. This guy was never wrong to begin with. I mean, he didn't have a reason to go back and check himself all the time. But he did it anyway. And naturally, he didn't have very good hours. This is where we want to spend our time. <clears throat> this works great when we're over in experience and we're using our, our pattern failure memory and all of that kind of stuff. But we're going to solve most of our problems when we're over here thinking. When we're using logic to say, okay, I didn't find the problem with my experience, so let's go use somebody else's experience, right? 
Where might we do that? Yes, Identifix. Technical service bulletins. Where else? Identifix. 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 IATN. How about the actual service manual? Sometimes there's stuff in there. For us, type. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is my way of looking at it. So we're over here doing a diagnosis. We're going to start off using our experience, pattern failures, all the stuff that we know. But we're only going to allow that to happen for so long. Right? We're going to get in there. If it's not an exact match, we're, not, we're going to get out of there. And we're going to get up here and get into our logic and our creativity and spend some time solving a problem. This, we can, we can pre-sell this, right? We can, look, we can say, i got a pretty good idea how long it's going to take me to do this. Do we know what this is going to cost us when, the, when it first comes in the door? No. So why in the hell do people sell this on the front counter? You can't. And you know what? Customers know it. They may not know cars, but they know there's no way you could know what's going on. So how come you're pulling out this number out of the sky? I don't trust that. I'm going to show you some things we can do with that. Okay, so once again, just remember, create a path so that you have choices and create new ones. And if you find one that's flawed and it doesn't work for you or it's become outdated, they say that a lot of Alzheimer's has to do not so much with a disease as the fact that Older folks have been around so long, they've filled the brain up. And certain parts of the brain just store things. Anybody in this room can't quote something from my cousin Vinny? Yeah, that, maybe there's a few of you. That was my cousin yeah. Vinny. So Am youths. I getting that old? Youths. Yeah, okay, well, we got a few. Anyway, <laughs> you see, guys, we store movies like it's nuts. I mean, we could probably, you would just be able to sit there and type some movies out if you wanted to sit it, right? You know, all, every single word in the whole movie. I'm going to suggest to you that if that kind of information may or may not be useful. Um, you, don't, you don't need to know your first phone number, unless, as the gentleman pointed out last night, your mother still lives there. Then you probably want to know. <laughs> Depends what a mother she is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so diagnostic realities, once again. If you have a bad attitude, it'll cost you more to get the car fixed. And I'm, of course, talking about you, not the customer. If you have a bad attitude, you're going to make it cost you more because you didn't want to work on it to begin with. And it's just going to go on and on and on, right? So I'm going to give you a few steps of some attitude adjustment things for you to think about because these are the ones I've heard over the years that just always make me laugh. I'm the guy at the shop that gets the cars that nobody can fix. Um, and I get them because sometimes I just decide I would rather keep my, my senior techs pumping out stuff. And I'm like, you know what, I'll take that one. And I, I get out there and they get to hear me use words that I don't usually use in front of my wife and children. <laughs> so as you might have guessed, this is a little lighthearted. I've got old Mike Meyer out there. A broken car is simply a group of interrelated systems that are not working the way they were intended. <laughs> Rather than concerning ourselves with the limitations and design flaws of these systems, our job is to return them to the imperfect but functional state in which they left their manufacturer. Unless, of course, you're Pierre, and Pierre makes them better. <laughs> he reinvents the wheel. Exactly. We don't necessarily have to do that. But sometimes we do. Cars don't care about your opinion of their manufacturer. They are what they are. I was telling the guys last night, this, this here car, I happen to live in the Hugo capital of the world. Oh my god. A block and a half from me. You remember that movie, Throw Mama from the Train, where everybody drove a Yugo? Because that was a Yugo plant there? Well, a block and a half from me, I got a friend that has a shop, and he specializes in Fiat's and Yugos. I mean, this guy's a masochist, right? <laughs> so, he's got so many Yugos, and he sells parts Scary. all over the world for them. You're lucky, usually I throw that at somebody. Word Yugo, that'll get you. He, uh, yeah, that's it, it just he made it fail. Um, anyway, he ships parts all over the world. Well, the city of Wheat Ridge said, this is embarrassing that Wheat Ridge is the Yugo capital of the world, so you got to do something about this. you got to get rid of them. They actually find him for every day they can see him. So they finally, he just built a fence around him. and Because uh, he's got a junkyard sitting right smack dab in the middle of the, of the business district. <laughs> <laughs> if you cannot solve a problem by changing a part, 
How about changing the thinking that led you to that part instead of blaming the manufacturer of the part? The true reality is that only about 2% of parts fail out there, but we return about 18%. So somewhere there's a disconnect. Now obviously a lot of times it's because we ordered the wrong part, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. But the long and short of it is that a lot of times you know parts get replaced that don't need to be replaced because it's just easier than actually spending the time diagnosing it until it didn't work. Or maybe reading up how the system works in old data or something like that Precisely. would help you out. That would be an idea. One we're going to look at in a little bit. Despite your convictions to the contrary, the car is not out to get you. I have, cut, I have had techs that are convinced that. Unless, of course, it's that car. <laughs> then you better move on. <laughs> Did you know that that car never actually existed? The 58 Fury only came in one color. It came in beige. But the 57 was available in red. Stephen King got it wrong. Thought you'd like to know that. I work on 58 Fury Golden Commando. But he has the money. <laughs> he does yeah. have the money. He did get the money to do it wrong, didn't he? And because he doesn't teach anymore, and it's one of my favorite things he ever said, Jim Linder always said, it's better it needed that. That's what the tech comes up when he misdiagnosed it and says to you, oh, it's better it needed that. But what he really meant, the subtext is, I didn't fix the car yet. And the only person that hates hearing that more than your customer is your service advisor, because they're the ones that have to explain it. So that's why it's our job to make sure we're right the first time. Or at least we create some realistic expectations. This one is a truth I have to deal with, uh, or used to have to deal with. Some technicians will spend as much time as it takes to prove their theory is right, <laughs> even if there's not enough facts to support it. You ever see a guy pull a TSB and he's going to prove that that damn TSB is the problem, no matter what, even though it doesn't really describe the problem? Those are things you've got to circumvent both for yourself and with others because that's where the money goes. That's where your margins go. It's right out the door when you're burning up time trying to prove something that isn't right. I had tech that worked for me for about three years before I couldn't take it anymore. And Dad really liked him, so it was hard to get rid of him. So he would sit in our morning meetings. We get together every morning because we have a tandem shop. So cars go in one behind the other. And so you have to plan the day because you can't tear apart a car back here. You can't get the other one out from underneath or, you know, whatever. So. We go over all of our work orders in the morning to figure out who needs to be in what spot and you know who's doing what and service advisors we share, you know, this is something else the customer told me when they dropped the car off, you know, all that kind of stuff. Twenty minutes it makes us more efficient and all that kind of stuff and, and we get to tell war stories and all that stuff from over the weekend. And, but long and short of it is this guy would sit there and every time there was a diagnosis, he would sit there, particularly his jobs. I'm calling a mass airflow sensor on that. I'm calling this and I'm calling that. Well, I got tired of hearing I'm calling that because every time they show up on my desk, he'd call them and they were wrong. So I kept track of him. He was right 6% of the time in his experiential calling. So not only does his experience suck, but he was, he was turning it in, trying to prove the stuff that he thought was wrong with wrong. So we sent his experience down the road to somebody else. Uh, but long and short of it is that this is a real trick if you get into there where you're trying to prove something that you don't really have the facts for, you got to say, am I just trying to prove this because it would be easier or should I just move on and not waste the time? All right. Now we're going to get into what I'm really seriously talking about here. With a flat rate hour approach to diagnosis, ineffective technicians are rewarded and skilled technicians are not. Anybody not get how that's true? Okay, I'd love to. Thank you for asking. So if you take an approach to saying, I'm going to charge an hour for whatever I do, I'm going to charge real time. If I'm diagnosing your car, I'm charging an hour. If this kid over here that's been doing it for, for three months or six months or ten years or whatever, he's doing it and I'm charging however many hours it takes him, but I get to it faster, who gets paid more? The inexperienced guy, right? Not the experienced guy. So when you get better at what you do, you need to start thinking about, and it's not easy to do, you've got to find that sweet spot. What's an average guy going to take to find this problem? And what did I have to go through to get to the knowledge to get to this problem? 
And if you're doing one that you've done before and you go, oh, I know what that is. I've had my butt kicked by that before. I can run a couple tests and prove that. Does that mean that if that only took you three tenths of an hour, that that's what you should charge for that? No. I can't believe how many guys are still doing that. And a lot of service advisors that are like, well, you found it that quick. Yeah, but do you remember the first time we did it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was upside down bleeding underneath the dash to figure this thing out. <laughs> That's common. <cool. laughs> the other problem is that a flat fee approach that a lot of shops like to do to diagnose, um, customers have a hard time perceiving value in this because they don't feel like they're in control of the repair process. They don't feel like they know what you're going to give them because how could you possibly know what's wrong to give them a flat fee? So I got a sort of in-between kind of approach that can not only support these guys, but make the folks that pay your bills happy. So here's what we're looking at. What if we could make more money? What if we could reduce our diagnostic inaccuracies? Train our younger techs, and this is my favorite part of this whole thing in a low risk situation. Reward our great techs without losing our profit margins and make our customers happier. I believe you can do all of these things at the same time by just having a little bit of control over that experience and creativity and which one's worth the most money. So I call this point five to thrive. I was a musician for a lot of years and a songwriter, so everything had to rhyme. So sorry about that. I, I didn't make the whole presentation rhyme, and I won't sing it to you, so you got that going for you. So this in this, you've got this in the back of your, of your uh, handout. This is something I whipped up for a shop that I'm doing some consulting with because they can't seem to figure out how to sell diagnostic work and how to control the process. Uh, they've got a gigantic shop. They're in almost the size of a Walmart. They specialize in visas, and they manu manufacture a lot of parts. So it can take five minutes to go find a technician. 